this is for the people staring out. I see you. There's a lot of space and look at what we've been through. See in the bigger picture. Yeah, you fit in it. I didn't make it up, but we're all witnesses. It is a pleasure to welcome you all into the shared moment. My name is Ray Cantley. I am Senior Manager, Centering Community and Wellbeing with Full Frame Initiative, and I am a mother. I am your neighbor. <sighs> Let's be in this moment, feel the support of the earth beneath you, surrounding you, and above you. Inhale and give honor to the land, give honor to the ancestors, Give honor to all conception. Pause and set the intention to be receptive, to replenish and release with a long exhale. Now feel the power of now and let your majestic existence take these intentions to positively impact all creation. I stand before you humbly pleased by the offering to sit at the feet of Mother Earth and ask for guidance. She told me, come closer. So I lowered myself to the ground. I sat astute, arms wrapped around my knees, knees close to my chest, chin rested, barefooted, spine straightened, while curiously listening for the next instruction. The dew is glistening and the grass is cool. And soon I find myself a bit distracted by the dampening of my dress as I settle into my seat. Then I refocus by noticing the delight of the sun kissing me with nourishing vitamin D. And I hear, what you do to the people, you do to the land. She said, teach the heart, lead the hands. Learn from the complexities of nature, always upcycling and make the best of every resource using the no matter what philosophy. How does the bee fly defying all odds? How do we communicate my, like mycelium to protect and service the sustainability of all kind? And like the birds, how do we sing no matter what? Rise up this morning, smiled with the rising sun. Three little birds, pitched on my doorstep, singing sweet songs. The melodies are pure and true. Singing, this is my message to you. Thank you, Bob Marley. Just transition. Then the wind blew in the lyrics of a great philosopher. And since we all came from a woman, got our name from a woman and our game from a woman, I wonder why we take from our women Time to heal our women, be real to our women. How we got money for war, but can't feed the poor. Thank you, Tupac. At the mercy of extraction, I hear again, what you do to the land, you do to the people, teach their hands, lead the hearts. See, we've been cultivating the land for some time now. It's been impregnated from the faith of the prayers of our ancestors, praying for hope, liberation, unity, regeneration, and the question arises, is today the day? The day that we stand with courageous love to give a hug to the flesh that suggests that we take out our pain by slandering and shaming and taking from each other the land, the life, the womb, the rights. Teach the heart, guide the hands, just transition. Transition to radical peace that stands against structural oppression because I'm guessing that killing our spirits will only leave broken souls to drive systemic transformation in the fears instead of holistic vision and strength. Teach the heart, guide the hands, just transition. Surrender to truth and reconciliation. Do away with exploitation. I apologize for every structure that supports the continuation of cruel, unjust treatment and the social norms that uphold every problematic system from the evaluating tools 
that enhances the exclusion of the people who are living through the harmful distresses of services that are built to help them. I apologize for the bombarding messages that come through our media sources that reach the eyes and the ears of our future. I apologize for this. There are those of us that sit still as our youth fall prey to the hold of oppression. And we know today, now thanks to COVID, that this is a global responsibility. And America has its place as a leader facing the truth about violence and how it's been doing its good job, strategically sustaining the status quo where competition overrides collaboration. I apologize for the lack of insight and action that supports transformative justice to hold responsibility to the hands that have the power to make it substantial. Where solutions for restorative structures incentivizes our courageous love that does away with the stigma and creates a culture that accounts for human dignity and liberation, annihilating ideas that protect us from needing to assimilate. While building supports that come from social structures like friends and family, neighbors, businesses, safety officers, teachers, janitors, housing providers, nonprofit philanthropic partners or persons, however you identify. But for this, we need policy, policy that holds America accountable, federal policy, state policy, a city initiative to center community because trusted relationships are priceless. So please let's reconcile the hurts of being pinned against one another as we feed our egos or unconsciously justify our fears and hopes to make it to the top. Is today the day? Is today the day that we witness the power of our voice in action guided by our deliberate healing? Teach the heart, guide the hands, I apologize. It takes our courageous share of vulnerable experiences, risking exploitation and other things like judgment and enforced stigma, all that may follow. But this is the way I've been able to powerfully find solutions. My voice has made the difference, but it's a global responsibility and America is a great place to start. Because what you do to the land, you do to the people. Teach the heart lead the hands, because this is for the people. Staring out, I see you. There's a lot of space, but look at what we've been through. And in a bigger picture, yeah, somewhere you fit in it. I didn't make it up, but you could be a witness. And today is the day. Go hug a tree. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Lorraine, thank you so very much for coming in and centering us and bringing in this space. I want to again welcome everybody to this conversation. And first off, a thousand thank yous to EDFU Foundation, an NGO with ECOSOC status at the United Nations, the reason why we are here today. Uh, and a shout out to the International Institute of Family Development, whose focus is supporting African nations uh, to realize more fully their national development plans. And Full Frame Initiative, which is hosting, which is having this conversation today, uh, which focuses on cultivating uh, well-being in the society of America uh, and creating a more equity, justice, and healing so that we can have a fairer deal than we currently have. So just thank all the organizations for coming here together. Partnerships absolutely matter. With that, I just want to kind of connect the dots a little bit to what's happening here in the United States and what's happening globally. Uh, no matter where you travel, you'll see women of old, old women, kind women, phenomenal women, no less, mm -hmm. night working women, corporate women, who do and wicked women worldwide the struggle seems to be the same. No matter if you're in the barrios or in the ghettos or in gated communities, there's the sameness. 
no matter what, a sameness that exists. And that sameness is a pain, a toxic stress and shame that's intrinsic in the infrastructure of the society that is there. And it creates an otherness. It creates a place where people don't have a fair shot at living wholly their best lives, more fully, more engaged to the richness of which they were born. Mm. And here we're at this place, at the United Nations, trying to figure out with all the other women of the CSW who are doing remarkable work worldwide, what is our contribution? How do we link up to this global struggle for wholeness, for rightness, for lifting up women who are the backbone of civilization and figuring out how do we create a fairer deal, a fairer society focused on well being in the United States of America? Hard to believe the land of the free and the home mm -hmm. of the brave happen to have an opportunity gap. And that gap hurts many, many people. And we cannot build back the society better if we do not include well being as a part a very integral part of the mix to, to have a wholer society. And with that being said, I wanna bring on here Katya uh, from Full Frame Initiative. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Viola. Thank you, Larray. Thank you all of us for joining us today. Um, we're really grateful to be here and to be here with you. My name is Katya Fell Smith. I'm the founder and CEO of the Full Frame Initiative. I'm also a mom, wife, sister, professional, a farmer, a lot of things. And I think that is part of what we wanna bring into the room today is all the things that all of us are. And that so often when we show up in these places, we show up as one thing. Mm. And that is part of how I think our power is held back is that we are all allowed to be only one thing in a given space. And so I invite everyone to be all the parts of you in this space, especially later when we get to what are the commitments that we can make and what are the actions we can take. In 1995, I worked with Francis and Cheryl and Kathy and Dottie and a few other women um, in, we're living in, in and around Cambridge and Boston, Massachusetts, um, to create a community. And the community we were creating was one where women could come and feel they belonged and it would be safe, as safe for me as a white, straight, cis woman, as for my trans sister of color, that there would be some predictability People could meet material needs without shame or danger and where it was co-created mm. and evolving with women. Not utopia, not puppies and rainbows and unicorns, right? But to try to be a little bit more intentional. And the thing is that Cheryl and Kathy and Dottie and Francis were women who weren't supposed to be able, weren't supposed to be able to do this. Because they are battling addiction. They're living on the streets in extreme poverty with a whole bunch of stuff going on in their lives. And the United States is a country, perhaps like others, but certainly very true in the United States, where you don't get to create and be fixed, right? You're either a broken or you're a fixer rather than everyone being able to be part of creating the healing for each other. And so this community that we created together, which is still going strong, became an organization and a um, program called On The Rise that was about how do we create spaces for women to, who are struggling and facing challenges to also bring their strengths and build on their assets and build their leadership. And when we started, we had $15,000 to do the whole thing for one year, which even in 1995, wasn't a whole lot to start an organization and pay people, et cetera. And so what that meant is that all of us had to run the sander 
in the free space the church was giving us to get the floor so that they wouldn't get people splintered and to do the painting and to sort the donations and to do the other thing, right? And to get through so many of the us them that are so baked into society, in our society. And that reconsideration of who builds and who benefits is part of what we ask you to hold and invite you to hold today. I realized after about, well, through the decade plus that I was at this organization on the rise, the organization and the women were celebrated for being far more successful than chronically homeless women are supposed to be able to be. So that was narrative shifting maybe. But the thing is, what everybody was focusing on is how are we fixing the women? And we weren't fixing the women. We were creating conditions that were different from what women were encountering outside of this safe space. And what I also realized was that there was a reason that this organization, like perhaps many of your organizations, was needed. And that's because we live in a country where things have been designed so that there are people who are going to be hurting more than others for the well being of some at the expense of the well being of others. And that actually the solution, the upstream solution, is to work for the structural changes so that we don't need as many programs like on the rise. And so that that community is one that is more prevalent than it is. And that there's broader recognition that everyone needs community and, the, and other elements of well being. So let me just stop and say, well, what well being? Gosh, that can mean a whole bunch of things to different people. So let me tell you what I mean, what we mean when we're talking about it here. When we're talking about how do we create a fair deal? What does it mean for the United States to be a country where everyone has a fair shot at well being? What it means are things that you know that we all know, that there are things that we are all hardwired for, every person is, that we all need to feel we belong. We all need to be able to be part of something and to be able to contribute and also to have people that we can depend on. We need to have, to be able to be safe being who we are. We need to have predictability. We need to have influence over our environment, the future, our relationships. Not control, but influence. And we need to be able to meet material needs without shame or danger. And we don't do it through a hierarchy. We do it by weaving and dodging and, and paying attention to all these different things all at once, because as an integrated drive that we call well being. And when you sit and recognize that, we all share this drive, and you start to look around and see. Whose belonging was the space I'm in built for? Mm. Whose safety is created and whose safety is compromised in this space, in this place? Through our rules, through how we built and designed, through our public policy and the policies of my program. We start to realize how all of us, at least in the United States, are often complicit in creating access to well being for some and using the tools of othering and isms to limit access for others. And so the work that we do at the Full Frame Initiative is to actually say what would happen if fair access to well-being was the taproot of our country? What would we change in how we see each other and how we interact with each other and also in how we design our society, how we design and decide on public policy, how we decide and design on what we build, literally what we build, housing and roads and infrastructure and how we and how we plan for a future and whose futures matter and as Lorraine has brought into the room how we do that in recognition that we are one of many species that is on this planet and that we need to exist with that planet and so well-being far I invite you also to think of well-being far from being the soft and squishy thing that it often is played up to be <laughs> but it's actually being this really intensive electrical drive in all of us. That if we tapped into equitably would be a, is a driving force for change 
in this country. So that's what we mean by well being, and that's what we mean by structural access to well being. I'm going to turn it over to my other colleagues uh, to share what this, how they are bringing this into their lives and their own work. I want to acknowledge first that um, if you did notice the sort of the listing of who was going to be here, uh, Gladys Carrion is not here um, due to a, a family emergency. We are so, so grateful for Phyllis Becker, who's a longtime partner and a wonderful ally who has stepped in. Uh, and uh, we're all in for a treat because Phyllis is here. So Phyllis, <laughs> I'm gonna hand it over uh, to you, Phyllis, okay. to lead us into um, more of a discussion about what this means and how you have brought this into your work. Thank you. And uh, I thought I was going to have to say, I am not Gladys. <laughs> but, so I'm Phyllis Becker, and I'm, I'm happy and honored, actually, to be here and a little intimidated to be taking the place of Gladys Carrion, who is a wonderful um, woman and leader, um, but um, glad to be a part of this conversation. I am a senior fellow with the Full Frame Initiative, and um, I also as a senior fellow work with connecting well-being to juvenile justice, which has been my lifelong career is working in juvenile justice. I had 20 plus years with the Missouri Division of Youth Services who went through a very radical transformation process and how they treated young people, their families and the community. And I was fortunate enough to be a part of that as a frontline staff, as well as in leadership roles. So I'm gonna, and, and um, the well-being intersection is in my role as director and deputy director in that position. We, we hooked up with Full Frame to um, look at how we can strengthen our system to be more intentionally about well-being. So I give you those details just to give you the background about some of the things I'm going to be sharing with you. Um, I balance my life in ways like writing poetry and gardening, and I'm a cat lover and uh, an avid jazz fan. I live in Kansas City, Missouri. So, <laughs> yeah. so, so I really appreciate Lorray, your words, your your poetry, and Viola, yours was poetry too. I don't know if it was on purpose or not, but it was beautiful. So thank you so much for bringing that piece of art into this conversation. Um, so I also wanted to share that uh, I have been fortunate, I had the fortune of having a mother whose worldview was always about the well-being of her family and her community. And it was hard for her. The racism and sexism that she experienced was very harsh. And she was often very sad about conditions for women and people of color. And so I'm doing this discussion in her honor today. Um, and um, because I think she set me on this path because I always want to find ways to think of how I can operate in a world to make a difference, um, to improve conditions, to create meaning and understanding and to give back. And that was from her. I'm wearing this pin in her honor and also for Madeline Albright who has sadly passed. Um, I think um, I, I have also been blessed in my career to work with strong women leaders who have led from an asset-based approach, um, which is not the easiest thing to do uh, and an easy way to be a leader in a world that focuses on what you did wrong versus how did you get there and what are your strengths and needs. Um, so. It's not the easy path, but it is the right path if we really want to truly make uh, this world better and, and bring our resources together to give everyone a fair shot at well being. So I was always, I have always been on the lookout for frameworks and like minded people that could help me live those values that were important that looked beyond traditional ways of operating. And so the well being framework was one of those cognitive life rafts, life rafts 
that moved me forward in my thinking as an individual, as a, a woman, as a leader, and a member of my community. And the reason why is because it is a systemic focus and it focuses on assets and builds resilience. It does not look at change, but it looks at sustainable outcomes. Um, when I was working with well being and looking at that framework in the juvenile justice world that I come from, one thing, um, and working with Katya in the full frame, one thing Katya said to me one day, she said, you know, change is hard, but sustainable change is harder. And that just has stuck with me. Um, and I think that moving in that orientation begins to help us think beyond that first flush of change that is so vulnerable and, and, and not always um, uh, integrated to strategies that create sustainable change in outcomes for the long run and the long term. Um, and recognizing the context that addresses equity, inequities and access issues uh, from a systemic perspective versus looking at symptoms, brick and mortar staff training, but actually doing a thorough assessment of what is holding the problems in place. A lot of times when we talk about transformative change, uh, folks, it really gets on surface change. And in juvenile justice, what I mean, it could be like, you know, creating a nice building for kids, but not changing the way we think about the young people in our system or the families. Um, bringing in um, lots of programming and services. But if we haven't changed how we think about the kids and families, it's not going to stick. And so a well-being framework helps to get you, has helped me, and I've seen help other people kind of get there, get that shift. So the things that you do are intentional around truly supporting um, kids' well-being, families' well-being, and communities' well-being. It um, provides that opportunity to identify the power in individuals um, rather than focusing on their deficits and fixing people. It was freeing. It saves you from being that savior, that fix it person. Um, and because it really focuses you and forces you to create opportunities to co-create strategies with individuals and families. Um, I was just on a webinar right before this one where um, mother from the juvenile justice system was talking about how, you know, that until folks could see her and her child as a person, a real person, that putting her on a focus group, um, doing a survey, none of that was really helping her to trust the system and none of it made her feel empowered or a part of being a part of the change. So well-being orientation really puts you into that framework and, um, helps you to not skip past those real core issues and that are and, and those isms that are baked in our system. Um, in juvenile justice, a well-being framework is really wonderful because it helps to integrate everything about what we know and are learning about adolescence and positive youth development and ACEs and brain science. It really um, kind of brings all these approaches, practices, um, research together um, in a way that we can use them more intentionally um, to actually to, to create well-being and support the well-being of kids and families and communities. Um, and the juvenile justice system, it gives, gives us a framework to tackle such things as disproportionality in the, the juvenile justice system. Black, brown, and LGBTQI youth are disproportionately a part of our systems. Um, how girls have historically been committed to the juvenile justice system, not for crimes, but for status offenders or their sexual behavior, and not an equal standard with boys, how girls and other youth who are victims of sexual trafficking often end up in the juvenile justice system viewed as offenders. And so a well-being framework helps you ask those questions about your system and how kids are impacting and interacting with your system um, to look at 
well, how did they get here? Not what did they do, but what, how did their lives and their trajectory get them in a place where they are today? And how did the forces around them and their community and country help them get to where they were today? And what are the strengths that they bring into the system? Um, it also helps you look at how youth are treated um, versus ineffective um, uh, punishment strategies that are often uh, a part of juvenile justice and how to, and the bigger picture, how to prevent kids from coming in the system in the first place. So in Missouri, you know, I'd have to say what it did for us is helped us to accelerate our relationships with families, kids in the community. We were doing some very good things, um, but when we intentionally put our well being lens on and some of the domains in terms of stability, safety, mastery, access to resources, it really boosted our relationship with parents and families and the community. Um, you know, when I started in the system, they said it was impossible and we had for kids to graduate for kids to go to college in our system, for kids to have a well-paying job. And what we found when we, we focused on kids and putting kids and families at the center, all that was possible and more. So our first graduation back in, way back when, I won't say how long ago, but we had five kids graduate in our Kansas City region. When I left, we had hundreds of kids in each of our regions donning caps and gowns and celebrating with their families. So I think um, for me, it brings hope and it brings partnerships and it brings collaboration to um, folks that we serve when we shift our narrative, how we think about folks and how we share power or give up power. So those are just some of the examples from our system. Um, and, um, and hopefully, you know, I, I'm loving being connected with folks in this world doing this work. And um, hopefully make my mother who did not have the same opportunities as I did proud. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, uh, Phyllis. I know that as I'm listening to the hope and the way that well-being in itself is, is the framework, but when you're weaving in the centering of community and you're seeing these people from an asset space and you're listening to them with an ear of how do we leverage your skills, gifts, and talents to help us design things that work for people. And that is a lot of where my world came from and a lot of where my focus in the work with Full Frame Initiative and centering well-being and community. And I see that this future is a lot more possible because of the determination of centering the voice of community, knowing that trusted relationships are priceless. Again, bringing someone into a focus group when they don't trust the relationship, you're going to get the bare minimum from them. They're going to be very cautious of the things that they say and what can come from what they say. They are very aware of how systems have watered down their language to turn it into something that's accessible on a very high academic level. And we wanna change that, we wanna shift that. We wanna create a practice that is baked in and ingrained and in weaving in the voices of those who are most closest to the inequities. And honestly, I don't know if I was out of turn, but I was moved by the spirit. That's a part of me. <laughs> Good, Viola, do you wanna jump in? And then we're gonna, oh, before we open it up. 
Yeah, you know, thanks for the opportunity for coming back to this conversation. No matter where we are worldwide, when we look at um, social welfare, so globally, we call it social welfare. In the United States, we have many names, child welfare, juvenile justice, child serving systems, and to include education. There's an opportunity gap. There's a gap between what occurs and what our best intentions are. And those workers who are in the field doing the best and the foundations and philanthropies that are putting a lot of effort and a lot of dollars into things, sometimes there's a lot of hits. And yet we find that there's a lot of misses. And those misses are folks who fall through the cracks, who miss the opportunity for having fairness. How do we create, I think this is a question for the audience, like, what, what are the opportunities that we have in order to create a fairer deal here in the United States where families are whole? Where's the opportunity that we have together uh, to figure out what are the pieces in order to have a transformational system of care? And I think if I was to answer that as an audience member, I would look at how do we create a healing environment? Not a system of protocols and processes, but a place in which we don't need to have more resilient women, more resilient children, more resilient men, but a healthier, holistic environment. And that environment is a place where things can blossom and thrive and grow. And I think of the work that the Full Frame Initiative is doing around well-being and its tenets of engagement. When we look at countries from around the globe, there's some structural policies in place for countries that are doing really well. And there's an intentional focus on the ability to feel happy, healthy, engaged, well-educated. There's an economic floor for many people. There's um, when we look at the opportunities for Flint, Michigan, and we think about that work and where the opportunity gaps are, we, to Lorraine's point, we have money for war, but we couldn't even fix the water in Flint, Michigan, which is a lot cheaper. And I think that comes to a conversation about who deserves to live healthy and whole and who doesn't. So I'm gonna bring this back to Katya to really talk more about Full Frame Initiative, the opportunities that we have with the blueprint and bring a call to action. Thanks, Viola. Um, and we thank you for the question. We're gonna to get to questions and answers uh, absolutely in a, in a minute. Um, we wanna open though with, can we get the slide up please? Um, Coming. Yes, just one moment. Thanks. Um, so, uh, thanks, Sasha. Um, so, we want to invite you in with sort of some ideas about first steps that you could take towards this. And we want to invite everyone to think about what is a commitment that you can make to yourself, to your community, to each other to begin to advance this work. This in and of itself isn't all, but this is a start. So we ask you to really stop and think about the places that you live, work, play, and pray. And to really ask whose well-being are these spaces built to support? Who, uh, and, and who is, has to be on edge or is explicitly not supported in those spaces. We am really uh, not just ask, but implore you if you run a program or a system, whether you're asking an individual or a community, we always, always ask, what do you need? It changes the conversation when we start with what do you have? And we listen and we honor and in partnering with people and communities to address the needs, we build on what people and communities have instead of undervaluing or undercutting it, which so often is what happens. If you're working in climate justice and land rights and climate change, how could a well-being framework 
help you make your case. This is something that we are starting to move into. We would welcome individuals and groups that want to partner with us in this, but we see a really strong connection, not just at sort of a theoretical level to how access to well-being for people is absolutely tied to climate and land, but literally how it has to feed into everything, including juvenile justice and child welfare and a lot of systems that we don't normally think of as needing to consider these, at least in the United States. And we've already talked about who's benefiting and who's being burdened by the way you're addressing change, right? There's how things are now, who's benefiting and who's being burdened, but often the process of change itself falls on the shoulders of those who have borne the burden the most. Who wears the risk and who holds the risk for change? The well-being blueprint is one way that you can get involved and we invite you to join us um, and we have bi-weekly discussions and there's a link that is cut off unfortunately on the screen but if you go to wellbeingblueprint.org um, and you will see it um, the well-being blueprint is a set of principles and recommendations for the united states that may we suspect certainly at the principal level have much broader applications but there are steps that can be taken in structure and policy to move us towards um, certainly the United States being a country where everyone has a fair shot at well-being. It is a work in progress. It will always be a work in progress. And it is shaped, as always, by people, the people who show up and who speak and whose work informs the work. So we invite you to join us there. What we ask you to think about now, and we invite you to put into the chat, is what's it what is if there's one thing here or one additional thing that you've heard that makes you think gosh this is something that i will do i can do to move my community my space my country towards one where everyone has a fair shot at well-being what is the next thing that you can do and we invite you to share that in chat and we will we will um obviously leave that that open we also invite your questions um and answers and we will give what answers we can uh using the q a function so since we already have some questions and answers um i'm thinking about time i think we should we start there folks team all right um the first question i think are there other examples or case studies we could access for how to apply this approach um, we have resources at fullframeinitiative.org that um, outline and, and give, uh, and there's some articles about um, some systems that have brought this in, whether that's domestic violence and housing and homelessness and child welfare and juvenile justice. There, there are lots and healthcare, there are lots of different places and spaces and fields that are bringing this in. And the broader application, of course, is with all of us. And, and as Phyllis was saying, and, and Lorraine and Viola, this all starts with how we see each other. And that I think is obviously much bigger than systems. I think that the systems in our country and perhaps in every country are just man, the problems in our systems are just manifestations of the problems. That they're just solid, more, maybe more solid and even more toxic, right? And so we're never going to be able to fully change how a system operates if we aren't also changing the larger narratives around it. I would add to that on the well-being blueprint, you have a map that um, uh, you can see on the in the in the website that has uh, where you can look at different communities that are doing things um, yeah. moving forward. Um, the well-being blueprint principles and lots of really, really exciting, innovative um, examples. And if any of you are doing work in the United States where that you feel belongs on that blueprint map, please let us know. There's a submit an example link and we wanna get you up on the map because this is work that takes all of us and that is inspired and that where people learn from each other and that is inspiring each other. Our next question is, what do you say to people who say that shifting narratives and behaviors takes too much time? Who wants to take that question? I guess there's an old adage that says, if not now, when? 
And and when when you're doing the work, you have to have a long game strategy because if you look at other folks who are doing the other end of the work, they have a long range strategy. And so if it takes too long and you quit, then you automatically let other people who don't hold the holistic values of helping all people and creating an equitable impact win. And so in this work, we have to find the room uh, to go the long haul. And if you can't go the long haul, have succession planning in place and a great dynamic theme that can continue and carry on. I would um, also add that building relationships does take time and commitment, um, but the alternative to not doing the systems change and the hard work of system change is continued poor outcomes for people and continued systems that may be harming folks in their systems. So um, the time and the energy and that path is definitely worth it, and um, but does take time. And I think it took us hundreds of years in this country to get to the narratives playing out today. Mm -hmm. And this this idea that of sort of magic bullet strategies that can be create durable change in three years, right, is part of the problem. Mm -hmm. That's the that's the myth that's been sold that keeps the problems in place that allows the oppor oppressions to continue. And so I think one of the things we can do is to point out that well we are actually reinforcing narratives every day or we're changing them. And that's right because we're all operating and all of our systems are operating based on a set of narratives. And so Viola, I absolutely agree. Like it's a question of today and it's a question of tomorrow and it's a question of a month, a year, a decade, decades from now. I don't want my kids to wonder why they have to start with work that should have started with me. And it's a matter of looking at the worst, like, are you seeing that people are worth however long it takes? Mm -hmm. And if your need is to feel like you're accomplishing, then start the conversation, move the conversation into shifting power, into creating the funding streams that will ensure that centering community is being put in place. If you need to feel as though there are um, things being done, then just create those little markers of I'm doing the thing to make sure that we get to, and of course, yes, it's going to take time. Look how much time it took. We're still fighting for civil rights today, but people are worth it. People and, are worth it. And to kind of add to what Lorraine said, it does take time, but on the other hand, you can start right now, just in how you interact with somebody just in how you say hello to somebody you walk by on the street, um, you know? So yes, long-term shifts and dismantling things that have been baked in does take time, but every day you can make a difference um, and support some your own and somebody else's well-being. Wondering if other folks in the in the audience also have thoughts on that. Lorraine, you're muted. I am multitasking. I am a mother and so <laughs> but yeah, when I think about the fact of being a mother, if anyone here has a little person in their world and they think about the fact that they are creating a world that that little person can one day experience, where we get to do away with these things, it's worth the time. It's worth the energy. It's worth the effort. Um, I don't see any new questions coming in, but I would love to give some context on the value, right? When I think about how I got into this work, uh, coming from someone who didn't have much of an opportunity, but to live into the narratives that were imposed upon me, being born in the 80s, where the war on drugs was released in my community, 
and it ravaged through every household where opportunities for fathers to be in the home was dismantled, where mothers had to try to figure out how do we secure all the jobs and take care of the families and uh, tend to the male who is being constantly in, placed in and out of a system that is breaking them and then sending them back home. Children who are being taken out of the home, which we already know is like there's a long history beyond uh, what we're experiencing today in the world of the juvenile justice system and children's services and the extraction of children from parents and families being torn apart. It's so worth the investment of how do we start these conversations of bringing in the people to say, how do we keep these families together? Because my life in itself has shown the result of what this transformative action does. And there's more that you can learn about me in the world. I don't want to get too uh, exploitative of myself in this space, but you can Google me. But what happened in the world of full frame initiative, seeing so much of what I offer and skills, gifts, and talents, and then contacting me and saying, Lorraine, I see you. What is this care out loud? This care out loud is Lorraine being someone who is deeply ingrained in the community, who stopped asking the question of why is this happening and started asking the question of what do I do about it and started sitting at tables and volunteering my time and started to learn what are the uh, challenges that systems are dealing with when they wanna create change, when they do wanna listen to community and then putting my voice forth as an advocate to say, okay, let's go and let's do lobbying, let's figure it out. I'm someone who had no idea about policy or what the power of it was. And that is what's happening in communities. That's what's keeping community out of the conversation. And so if you really wanna think about the investment of time, sit down with someone and invest in the relationship that gives them access to a thinking that will help the time speed up. Because if we're all on the same page and what we need, as a country, then it's easier to move it forward. When you think about the way COVID and the pandemic started to just post signs everywhere, if you have everybody talking about well-being, if you have everybody talking about advancing a way of living that works for everybody, then it's more than likely that we'll all walk around with masks, even when they say you can take your mask off. That's my two cents on it. <laughs> I'm so glad you're back, Viola. <laughs> Thank you, Lorraine. That was beautiful. In the world of technology, things occur. And we're in a virtual world. And we've been here for two years in a virtual world. And so for all of my people in Africa, in Asia, in South America, you understand when your internet is kind of crappy. And so that's what happened here. And I'm in the United States of America, so don't believe the lies that everything on these streets, on these sides of the water, is littered with gold. <laughs> mm. So as our time um, comes to a close, thank you all for joining us today um, and for your thoughts. And uh, as things percolate, we hope you'll be in touch. Sasha, could we get the slide that has folks' contact information on it? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, and we are eager to hear from you and learn with you and learn from you uh, about this work because we can just scratch the surface and hopefully, hopefully spark, spark your imagination and your interest in an hour conversation. Uh, and we look forward to further conversations to, see, to, to really drill down on what feels really relevant to you. Lorraine is going to close us out. Um, and uh, wow, we are. We are lucky to have this close out, so stay. I encourage everyone to stay. Thank you. Uh, before she does, I wanna thank all of our panelists um, for uh, being here today and for uh, being part of this conversation and for everyone in joining us. Uh, and please do make a commitment to moving us towards wherever you are, a space, a place, a country where everyone has a fair shot at well-being. Thank you. Lorette? Thank you.
And I did see the question of how do you further the conversation? Let's stay connected. Full Frame Initiative's purpose is to connect partners and allies nationwide. People are doing great things in places that we can all share and we can learn insights and we could learn together and we could continue to advance the conversation on how do we center well-being and create a world where everyone has a fair shot. And so with that, let's change the default. And if you don't know about default, join some of the conversations with Full Frame. We'll talk to you about mental models and shifting them. But in the meantime, yeah, I've been laid down, but watch how it come around here. It's my agreement that I won't stop reaching, breathe in, breathe out. My students, my teachers, change makers and seekers, it ain't just me speaking, I'm pleading for peace on the blocks and these streets. For these kids, I got thought, I got heart, I got these. And in the years that I was taught that it was set by default for the hoods to get caught up and see, that's how I was brought up. And so I put my pain on the side. I took my faith and put it in dry, breathe in, breath out. And I changed the default. Join with me. We can all change the default. I thank you so much. You obviously have a heart to do it. That's why you joined us today. And now we can do it in a community, together, collaboratively. Let's make the difference. And there's still some time. So if my partners want to give a, a lasting goodbye, something sweet to say, something to inspire, please feel free. A shout out to Ed Food Foundation again uh, for bringing us all together, for having us uh, have this space at the United Nations. A big shout out to the United Nations CSW, to the organizing committee there for doing amazing and fabulous work, six to six years of doing amazing and fabulous work, focusing on women and creating a fair shot for women around the globe. Appreciate you.